Whenever there's a mega trend in the world, such as the EV market, you have many companies coming out of the woodwork thinking that they will capitalize big on that mega trend. We've seen that recently with AI hype. And in the automotive market, which is what we're going to focus on today, there can be a lot of nonsense out there and you have to be careful in what companies you decide to put your money. Today, we're going to discuss a few companies that fall into this category. The first is Indy Semiconductor, and we have invested in this company at one point as well. So we're going to talk about whether the hype is real and if we should continue to invest in Indy Semiconductor. We're also going to discuss Navitas, Microchip, a microcontroller leader, as well as Amazon's recent quarters earnings report and whether or not we're continuing to buy Amazon. Casey, just in the last couple of weeks, I think just to reiterate your point, we have seen a lot of weirdness happening in the EV market. It's interesting to see this still going on here in 2023 after the really nasty bear market of 2022. But we had the EV startup VinFast have its IPO. Basically, they sold a very small float of shares to help keep the market cap elevated during their SPAC merger. That's odd. Hopefully no one bit on that when that made its publicly traded debut. We also had Wolf Speed earnings last week, which we have been highly critical of for over a year now. And hopefully we helped steer investors in the right direction on that because they had to change some of their financial reporting to include startup costs in the cost of goods sold as they ramp up their brand new fabs for silicon carbide electric vehicle chips and it's getting real ugly as we predicted it would so just in the last couple of weeks those two things popped up and i think burned a lot of investors and took them by surprise but it really shouldn't have if we dig in to these things we should be able to see it coming. Like you said, every once in a while, you might find a gem when there's like a new mega trend, a new secular growth trend popping up, but you're going to find a lot of weirdness as well. Indy Semiconductor is a fabulous chip designer. And as we said, it's aligned itself with the auto industry. And previously, what was hundreds of dollars per car is now thousands of dollars per car when it comes to semiconductor tech. So, Nick, how is Indy Semiconductor trying to differentiate itself from other auto-focused companies? Yeah, Casey, this is an interesting one because the company still talks about the three trends affecting the modern automobile. So, of course, you have vehicle electrification. You have in-cabin infotainment, basically digitizing of the displays for drivers the infotainment system for the driver and passengers, creating some in-cabin connectivity via wireless networks and such. So that's the second one. And then the third one, and related to all of the above, is advanced driver assist systems. And eventually, when enough progress is made down the road, start talking about vehicle autonomy, the ability for the car to drive itself. So the company addresses all three prongs of growth in tech for the modern automobile. But as they've made more acquisitions in the last couple of years, they've focused more in on the sensors, that is to say analog chips used for advanced driver assist systems. And they're starting to call this sensor fusion. So taking things like radar, LIDAR, computer vision, merging all of that data into useful digital information for the car's onboard computer to process and make driving decisions on. Does it have any large competitors? Absolutely. They're almost all large competitors. My conductors are an expensive industry to get into. I'll just drop you the quote from their last annual report that was released early in 2023. The market for high-performance analog, digital, and mixed-signal semiconductors for auto applications is competitive, although recent consolidation across the semiconductor industry has reduced the number of viable competitors and created design opportunities for us. So in other words, they're trying to fill in some gaps that have been left by some of the really big players in this space. 
about those. Our primary competitors are other auto-focused semiconductor companies, including Infineon, Monolithic Power Systems, NXP Semiconductors, Renesas, and ST Microelectronics. I'll also throw Texas Instruments and Analog Devices in there because they also have sizable automotive sales. But as far as the ones that they rattle off here in their 10K, they've excluded them. But they have ample competition in this space, many of which do design work and have in-house manufacturing as well. Indy, as you said, Casey, is fabulous. They only design and then they rely on a third-party foundry to actually manufacture the chips for them. Let's talk about their financial performance a little bit because this is a big point. The company grew 102% year over year to 52.1 million, which was meeting their guidance. Their guidance for revenue run rate was 205 to 200 million dollars annualized. So, it sounds like the company has had absolutely stellar growth over the last year. Is there a catch? That's a leading question. Yes, there's definitely a catch. This is growth by acquisition, primarily. They're obviously doing some internal organic design as well. But this company went on an absolute acquisition spree the last few years to get itself in position. They purchased design segments from On Semiconductor. They purchased internal segments from Analog Devices, the most recent Geo Semiconductor, to integrate all of these different analog sensors together and execute on their plan for advanced driver assist system. Growth by acquisition. Again, important point here, they've been able to do this because this is a fabulous company, which means they don't have to worry about the most capital intensive part of the semiconductor industry. That's the manufacturing. They don't have to buy the big expensive pieces of equipment. They've been able to go out and pick up these various pieces of IP, patents and designs and whatnot, and create like this patchwork. So that's where most of this growth is coming from, Casey. It's acquisition. That's the catch. Was Indy Semiconductor a profitable company at this point? No, it is not. And the stock fell by a pretty good amount after this recent earnings update because they missed some of their goals on adjusted profitability. They keep saying that they're going to start reaching an adjusted profit by the end of this year. but. They pushed that goal back just a little bit as they continue to realize some sizable expenses from integrating all of these different designs they've acquired. I know you mentioned to me, Nick, that stock-based compensation is also diluting a lot of the share growth for this company. Is that right? Casey, I'd like to cite the history of stock-based compensation that you put together early this year. Very few viewers actually watched that video. And I think it's really important to understand where stock-based compensation started. Actually, you can trace its roots back to the semiconductor industry. We don't harp on this a ton because it's just part of running a technology business. You have to pay the talent because you don't want the talent to leave and become a competitor. But it's most definitely worth calling out here and highlighting it at Indie Semiconductor because they have issued a lot of stock to make those acquisitions. And they continue to pay a lot of employee stock-based comp to sustain the path that they're on right now. So you mentioned the year-over-year -year growth. They're doubling in size, and they have been for the last year. They've been roughly du doubling in size. Again, a lot of that by acquisition. But when you look at revenue on a per-share basis, so you don't just take the revenue and figure the year-over-year -year growth, but you actually take revenue per share and calculate it on a year-over-year -year growth basis. Instead of getting about 100% year-over-year growth, we're actually only looking at a company growing at about 75, 76% year-over-year growth on a per share basis. Again, that, that is not at all a bad rate of growth, but it's because of multiple acquisitions and they're diluting the actual growth. So I think a lot of investors get drawn in by that 100% year over year increase in sales, but need to put a really big asterisk on that because of the stock issuance that's diluting that. And here's the issue with that. Stock-based compensation ends up getting embedded in employee contracts and it extends years into the future. 
And where it becomes dangerous is if a company continues paying out that stock-based compensation, and then we hit a downturn in the market, or let's say Indy's growth suddenly slows, which is going to happen at some point, especially if they don't continue acquiring new designs and segments from other chip makers, their growth is going to slow. And suddenly you get a company that's maybe not growing nearly as fast as you thought it was. And on a per share basis, that growth suddenly becomes very pedestrian can be a dangerous situation, especially for a company that also does not turn a profit yet. The balance sheet has changed a bit as well. They have cash and short-term investments of $181 million, but $156 million in long-term debt at this point. Yes. Also, not the squeaky clean balance sheet the company had when we had originally invested in it and later sold out. Yeah, they not only have shelled out cash, issued lots of stock, but also took on some debt for some of the later acquisitions they've made. All-time highs for Indy in stock price were around $16 per share. Now it's closer to $7 per share. Is it a good buy at this price now that we've had a pullback in the stock price? That's difficult to say, Casey. Again, this company, not profitable. They don't expect to even generate an adjusted profit until late this year. And it looks like progress on that front is going to be very bumpy. It's very difficult to stick an intrinsic value on this business at this point without a timeline on when they'll start pulling cash in versus shelling cash out. And it's not even really necessarily all that cheap on a price to sales ratio, 5.8 times trailing 12 month sales. If they continue doubling their revenue, for the foreseeable future. Yes, this could be a very cheap stock price, but eventually at some point, the company is going to have to start turning a profit, especially as they scale up. They're not a tiny business anymore. The outlook was for $60 million in revenue in Q3 2023. Still very small, but not tiny. It would be nice to see the company make some positive progress on profit. I think you have to categorize this as a high risk, and only potentially high reward business. And there's no one single quarter that I think is going to say, okay, this is a turning point for the business. This is something that is going to have to play out over years. And so for investors that want to make a bet, I would think I'd emphasize that word, a bet on Indy Semiconductor, you really need to apply that small cap stock discipline where you make it part of a basket of other small cap stocks and then forget about it and assume that this is a stock that more than likely will underperform the market at best. But if they do execute, maybe you found a gem, but more than likely not. It's probably just going to underperform the market like most upstart small cap stocks do. Speaking of small cap startup companies, tell me a little bit about Navitas. It's a peer to Indy Semiconductor. How does it stack up in terms of financial health? Yeah, this is another startup, Casey, and so it goes in the same bucket, potentially high reward, but very, very high risk. And I think we saw this after their earnings report, they beat on revenue growth expectations. And so we saw the brief tick up in the stock price only for that to be unwound again, because it doesn't change the story. One quarter of growth doesn't change the story. This company loses a lot of money. This is another one that has really tried to cash in on EV hype specifically. If Indy is pivoted a little bit towards the sensor fusion, advanced driver assist systems, Navitas started out as a a GAN, gallium nitride power chip designer. They also made an acquisition. They also do silicon carbide now. So a lot of the revenue is actually just in mobile phone charging, which is a very low value, low margin business pivoted to silicon carbide to try to take advantage of fast charging stations for EVs. And so, yeah, we're getting fantastic looking growth from Navitas. But last quarter, 18 million in revenue, 110% year over year increase. But they reported a $27 million loss. Even on an adjusted basis, mostly the adjustment is backing out stock-based compensation. Again, this is another one I think We don't harp a lot on stock-based compensation, but this one really needs to be highlighted. It goes from an operating loss of $27 million to 
an adjusted operating loss of 9.6 million when you back out employee stock-based compensation. Casey, up until just the last couple of quarters, Navitas actually was reporting stock-based compensation far and away in excess of actual revenue. This was a SPAC stock from a couple of years ago during the market hype. And we still see a lot of investor interest in this, but just remember the amount of dilution happening here. Revenue growth on a per share basis is far and away lower than what is actually being reported in headlines. Company is reporting a steep loss and there's no timeline on when that will change. Very high risk and only potentially high reward if the company can execute. One other thing I'd point out too, Navitas has also pivoted. They were also a fabulous designer. But remember I said that this company makes pretty low margin chips, only $18 million in revenue. And they've actually reported that they've now shipped tens of millions of their devices. That helped put that in perspective for you as far as like the market for these charging chips, GAN or silicon carbide, it doesn't matter. Their particular market, pretty low value chips. They actually started purchasing a couple of epitaxy machines from a company called Eichstron. It's a small German company that competes against applied materials, AMAT, the primary provider of epi equipment. Navitas also now getting a little bit into the semiconductor manufacturing game. This company has a kind of a wild strategy. It doesn't look to be super narrowly focused. Started out as gallium nitride, made the silicon carbide acquisition. Now they're going to do a little bit of their own manufacturing. This one, investors really tread lightly, think twice, maybe three times before you hit the buy button if you do it all on this one. This is a bit messy. Just for the record, we do not own either of these stocks at this point, Indy Semiconductor or Navitas. We'll move on to a stock that we do own, Microchip. Microchip is a semiconductor company that designs, develops, manufactures, and sells microcontrollers. So it's an integrated device manufacturer. 57% of its revenue comes from these mixed signals microcontrol units, 28% analog, and 15% everything else. Their largest revenue segment is industrial at 41%, followed by data center and computing automotive, and then communications and consumer appliance. So Nick, maybe you could just briefly tell us what a microcontroller is and why it's such an important piece of hardware and software. Yeah, that's an important little bit that you just said there, Casey, hardware and software. So think of a microcontroller almost as an all-inclusive little computer. It has a processor. There's a little bit of memory in there that stores the program, the software that operates whatever the microcontroller is operating. There's usually some sockets for peripherals. It could be a display or it could be some way to receive input. If it's a piece of factory equipment and an employee on the factory line needs to input some information into the computing system. So it's almost like a little mini computer on a chip. Casey, you also mentioned analog. So they do some design work with sensors. Oftentimes it's those sensors, a chip that interacts with a real world signal. Those get plugged into the microchip system. And then also under the other segment that you mentioned, FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. I know one of your favorite is lattice semiconductor. So microchip and lattice, a little bit of overlap there in the FPGA market. Microchip likes to talk a lot about its full system design. And so one of the ways they've been winning market share the last few years, especially in microcontrollers, FPGAs, also the sensors, is they can design a full system for their customers, which is important because many of these customers, maybe it's an industrial business, a manufacturer, an automaker, they're not tech companies. They don't know what to do with the chips when they get them. So microchip says, hey, here's the chip system that we've designed, and we've also come up with the software you need to operate it. So complete, ready to go off the shelf piece of computing equipment that's ready to just plug into whatever piece of machinery or manufactured product you're making. You mentioned Lattice Semiconductor, and some of the other very large competitors, I would imagine, are Texas Instruments and NXP. 
Yes, as well as Infineon, Germany's largest chip designer manufacturer. So let's talk about their financials as well. They were fantastic. 2.29 billion in revenue, which is up 2.5% quarter over quarter and 16.6% year over year. Gross margins, 68%. Operating margin, 48%. Earnings per share was $1.64, which is up nearly 20% year over year. So fantastic financials in the most recent quarters. Earnings report. How do they stack up compared to similar companies who've reported recently? This company has been picking up market share. And so the operating margins are far in excess of what you'll get at ST Micro and NXP Semiconductor, two of the peers that you mentioned, Casey. They still lag a bit behind Texas Instruments, but TI is a lot bigger. And microchip making fast progress on that front, Texas Instruments taking a big step back on some of their operating profit margins as of late. So the company doing really well executing, they're one of the companies that has taken this slightly different approach in recent years in the wake of the chip shortage in 2020 and 2021. A lot of customers that didn't have enough supply, enough inventory on hand, went to chip makers and said, hey, we need more chips ASAP. <laughs> and microchip said, okay, but we're gonna need to sign some long-term supply contracts. You can't keep canceling orders on us after we've manufactured chips and then we get caught holding the bag. So they've gone out and they've been one of these companies trying to get long-term supply agreements from customers. They've gotten a lot of them and have a very large backlog of orders. But one thing to bear in mind here going forward is maybe this is short-term in nature. It maybe is just indicative of where we are right now with the global economy here in 2023. But on the last earnings call, management said some of those customers are trying to cancel those non-cancelable long-term agreements, or at least trying to delay shipment. They're in cash conservation mode. Many of these industrialists are just trying to hold on to as much cash as they can. And again, back to their old ways, trying to shift the financial obligation onto microchip. Microchip trying to work with them as best they can. So it looks like growth is going to slow significantly in the next quarter, maybe just 9% year over year growth. And then in the fourth quarter, we might see something a bit more significant in the slowdown department, maybe even a year over year decline. We'll have to wait and see. Maybe this is short term in nature, maybe come calendar year 2024, the company back in all out growth mode again. But this is a situation to definitely keep an eye on right now and monitor very closely. I think it was notable that during the conference call, Microchip did not mention AI. And we know that every company right now in their earnings call mentions AI in one form or another. Is this something that we need to worry about? Is Microchip ready for this AI age? Absolutely. They do lots of stuff with AI, machine learning. Those microcontrollers and the analog chips that collect real-world signals you need some sort of AI algorithm to process and get it ready for maybe the central computer or the accelerated computer that does the big number crunching. So microchip, most definitely part of an integrated AI system with its microcontrollers, FPGAs, a few of those sensors in there as well. They are ready for AI. Management is not much in trying to hype results, which we like. We are perfectly fine with that. Yeah, I, I absolutely respect that. <laughs> That's okay. So the stock is close to $80 per share right now. Did the recent sell-off create a good buying opportunity for a microchip? We think so, but we just nibbled. Casey, okay, so this is a small position for us, and we just added another handful of shares to our small position here. The stock does appear to be very cheap, about 18 times trailing 12-month earnings just 13 times next year's expected earnings. A lot of this, though, is contingent on, of course, the business, at the very least, holding on to its revenue gains the last few years, if not growing a little bit. It's still increasing its operating profit margins. Its guidance through the next couple of years still, still factors in 10 to 15% average annual growth. So not the fastest growing business, but still great growth. Again, great operating margins. The company repurchasing stock 
and increasing its dividend payments with all of its free cash flow. So I think for the long term, we thought this was a good spot to nibble. Uh, but again, I think probably just to reiterate, though, this is contingent on the company executing well in 2024. If there is some more economic softness that trickles down to microchip in calendar year 2024, we could see the stock falling a bit more than where it is right now. But we're long-term investors. We buy things for the indefinite future. We thought this was a decent enough entry point to pick up a few more shares, but we're watching to see how this one reacts in the coming months as the company provides some more guidance going forward. On Microchip's balance sheet, they have $271 million in cash and investments, but $6 billion in long-term debt. So we know that they have been paying down this debt over time, but still a large debt balance. Why is this, Nick? So remember in the Indy Semi bit, they mentioned Indy in their 10K mentioned a lot of semiconductor industry consolidation. This is one of those companies that consolidated. They acquired a very large peer, Micro Semi, back in 2019, took on a lot of debt. In the not so distant past, at following this acquisition, Microchip had over well over $10 billion in debt just a couple of years ago. So they have been paying it down very aggressively with cash. And anything left over after retiring debt, they have been returning it to shareholders. They see no large need for that cash in the foreseeable future, which is why they've been able to aggressively whittle down that indebtedness. But it's a good point you bring up just to bear that in mind. There is still a bit of work to do for this company to work off its indebtedness. By now, everyone has seen the numbers for Amazon's fantastic earnings report. Amazon flipped from a operating loss last year to an overall operating profit this year. But today we're going to focus on the AWS cloud services portion of the business because that has been giving up some market share over the recent few years. Yeah, this became really apparent late last year, Casey, when we covered Oracle Cloud striking that really big landmark deal with NVIDIA. And then in March of 2023, NVIDIA announced DGX Cloud, the ability to rent their most powerful GPUs, first with Oracle Cloud. DGX has since expanded to other platforms. We covered that last week, if you missed that video. And AWS, it looked like, was a bit flat-footed in this new generative AI race the last couple of quarters. And so two things have happened. We started investing in Amazon again last year towards the second half of 2022 during the bear market primarily because of AWS, Amazon Web Services. That's what makes all the money for Amazon. At least the last few years, that's what's floated the business. E-commerce hasn't done much for Amazon, although that's starting to change with the ads and third-party seller services. Those are fantastic businesses as it looks like Amazon leans into being an e-commerce platform versus just an e-commerce retailer itself. But as far as AWS, we went from the company going from 30% growth rate down to just 12% year-over-year growth this last quarter, Q2 2023. Annualized revenue of $88 billion. A little chart here showing their peers, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, Oracle Cloud, a tiny little digital ocean. You can see the growth rate falling significantly and in tandem with that growth rate decelerating. AWS operating margin has fallen from a peak of 30% operating profit margin in 2021 down to 24% the first half of this year. It looks like Amazon management is expecting this to be the low point. It looks like AWS revenue growth will accelerate. Operating margins will start to improve again as they've done a lot of work with customers to get like the right mix Basically working with customers who are interested in saving cash. Again, this is the same story this year. Businesses bridging a slowdown in economic growth by hoarding cash. And one of the ways some of them have been doing it is cutting their cloud infrastructure spend. So it appears that is now mostly behind AWS. 
paving the way for maybe a resumption of faster growth and improving operating margins again. We'll see how this plays out. And of course, AWS investing in its own in-house AI chip design, going out and purchasing NVIDIA GPUs as well. They appear to be very well set up for this new generative AI era. According to Wall Street analysts, they expect a consensus $33 billion in total Amazon free cash flow for 2023. And the stock trades currently for about 42 times expected 2023 cash flow. Current stock price is around $133. What do you think about the valuation for this stock, Nick? We think it's very fair, especially considering, as you mentioned earlier, Casey, Amazon flipping from a loss, pretty steep losses last year. They had to right size their e-commerce, especially their warehouses. They overbuilt early in the pandemic. Also right-sizing some of the workloads for customers with AWS. So if we assume a big rebound in free cash flow generation this year and next, we think this is a very fair-priced stock. And for us, a good entry point, assuming Amazon continues slower, but still very steady and solid growth over the next decade. Again, new ways for them to generate revenue and highly profitable revenue from their e-commerce platform via selling ads to third-party merchants on the platform, as well as services. So like shipping for those third-party sellers, managed site and inventory and all the stuff that you would need to manage an e-commerce business. If you were a merchant via Amazon, you can have them take care of that for you. We think some nice profitable growth outlets there for the business in addition to AWS. We think this is a decent entry point for us to add a little bit more to our position. If you're feeling a little bit down because of the recent market downturn, take heart. <laughs> this is very common in any bull market to have a pullback like this. If you have some questions about what may be going on, we did have a brief segment in our most recent video, which we'll link here that you can take a look at that explains some of the reasons that we do have a pullback. Stay tuned. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Don't miss a video. We have Palo Alto Networks, Applied Materials, and Synopsis coming up later this week. Three of our favorite companies to invest in for the long term. Companies that have great business models and riding secular growth trends. We will see you again here at Chipstock Investor.